In this presentation, we are going to take a look at 1 Nephi chapters 11 through 15. So with that, let's get started. Let's start with 1 Nephi chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 1, the phrase, I set pondering in my heart. Who can assess the value of pondering, the impact of a righteous soul meditating upon the eternal word? Who can measure the worth of a careful and deep reflection upon the things of God? The things of God are of deep import. Joseph Smith wrote from Liberty Jail, quote, And time and experience and careful and ponderous and solemn thoughts can only find them out. End of quote. Some of the greatest revelations of all time have come as a direct result of pondering. The boy prophet pondered upon the passage in James 1, 5 through 6. That is, one, he reflected upon the message again and again. And two, he likened the scriptures unto himself, applied the ancient message to a modern setting. As a result of that pondering and prayer, the heavens were rent and the great gods of heaven came to earth again. And thus was commenced a marvelous dispensation of grace. Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon, in the midst of their inspired translation of John 5 and their consideration of the order and nature of the resurrection, had a similar experience. Quote, While we meditated upon those things, the Lord touched the eyes of our understanding, and they were opened, and the Lord and the glory of the Lord shone round about shown round about, end of quote. The vision of the glories, one of the greatest panoramic oracles of all time, a glimpse into man's past and an insight into his potential glory, was vouchsafed to mortal man. Likewise, why Joseph, President Joseph F. Smith pondered upon the first epistle of Peter and of our Lord's post-mortal ministry to this world of spirits, there was granted to him a vision of the redemption of the dead, a vision that offered saving insights into the manner in which the Master organized his righteous servants for the pre presentation of the message of the gospel to those who sat in darkness. Pondering and meditation are forms of sacred devotion, quiet and effective moments of prayer by which man draws near to the infinite and is made a partaker of the things of God. In regard to savoring the words of holy writ, Nephi exulted, My soul delighteth in the scriptures, and my heart pondereth them. Behold, my soul delighteth in the things of the Lord, and my heart pondereth continually upon the things which I have seen and heard. The phrase, I was caught away in the spirit. Meaning sometimes prophets and worthy men and women are caught away in the spirit in the sense that they are taken into vision in order to see and hear unspeakable things. On other occasions, such as was here the case with Nephi, they are transported bodily to another place wherein they might experience those things which God desires they experience. Such was the case with Moses, Jesus himself, and Philip. The phrase, into an extremely high mountain. Mountains are frequently the meeting places between God and man. They are, na nature's, na they are nature's temples, the portion of intersection between the finite and the infinite. 11.4. Believest thou? The Spirit was here assessing Nephi's bearing capacity and discerning the depths of his desire to see and know all that his father did. Believest thou the words which I speak? The Lord had similarly asked the brother of Jared. Mohanrai Moriankamer answered, Yea, Lord, I know that thou speakest the truth, for thou art a God of truth and canst not lie. 11 verses 4 through 6, the tree, the son of the most high God. Faith is not exercised in trees, and the spirit was not simply inquiring into Nephi's knowledge of a form of plant life. Indeed, it was not a belief in the tree which would qualify Nephi for the manifestation to follow. Nor was this the concern of the spirit. The tree was obviously a doctrinal symbol, a sign of an even greater reality. Yet the tree was of marvelous import, for it is 
for it is the symbol, even from the time of paradise, of the central and saving role of Jesus Christ. 11, chapter 11, verse 7, the phrase, this thing shall be given for a sign, meaning the Spirit here began to unfold the nature of the type shown to Lehi, the tree whose fruit was most glorious and beautiful and sweet of all that is known to man. The tree had been given, as we shall shortly see, for a sign, as a symbol of him whose branches provide sacred shade which shields one from the scorching rays of sin and ignorance. Indeed, this vision was to be more than an involvement with an abstract concept called the love of God. It was a messianic message, a poignant prophecy of him towards whom all men must press forward on the straight and narrow path which leads to eternal life. Chapter 11, verse 8, the phrase, I looked and beheld a tree exceedingly of all beauty. The meaning, the principles of eternal life centered in Jesus Christ, the tree, taste good. The prophet Joseph Smith said concerning the principles of the gospel and comparing them to the fruit of the tree, said, quote, The first principles of man are self-existent with God. God himself finding he was in the midst of spirits and glory because he was more intelligent, saw proper to institute laws whereby the rest could have a privilege to advance like himself. The relationship we have with God places us in a situation to advance in knowledge. He has power to institute laws to instruct the weaker intelligences that they may exalt with himself, that they may be exalted with himself, so that they might have one glory upon another and all that knowledge, power, glory, and intelligence which is requisite in order to save them in the world of spirits. This is good doctrine. It tastes good. I can taste the principles of eternal life, and so can you. They are given to me by the revelations of Jesus Christ, and I know that when I tell you these words of eternal life, they are given to me. You taste them, and I know you believe them. You say honey is sweet, and so do I. I can also taste the spirit of eternal life. I know it is good, and when I tell you of these things which are given me by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you are bound to receive them as sweet and rejoice more and more. End of Joseph's quote. Chapter 11, verse 11, the phrase, to know the interpretation. It is one thing to receive a manifestation and quite another to understand it. The interpretation, like the revelation itself, must come from the Holy Ghost, the phrase, the Spirit of the Lord, meaning the expression Spirit of the Lord is used some, used some 40 times in the Book of Mormon, and almost without exception, it has reference to the Holy Ghost or to the light of Christ. If indeed here the Holy Ghost was Nephi's guide and teacher, this occasion is of tremendous significance, for it is the only scriptural occasion where the Holy Ghost makes a personal appearance to man. As the prophet Joseph explained, the Holy Ghost is a personage as, and is in the form of a personage. You can see that in Dr. Cummins 130, 22, 23. Chapter 11, verses 13 and 15, the phrase, a virgin, fair and white. Isaiah had taught over a hundred years earlier, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The Book of Mormon is an additional witness that Mary, the mother of the Son of God, was indeed a virgin, and that the means by which the Son of the Father was conceived and born was miraculous and transcendent. Elder Bruce R. McConkie states, quote, Can we speak too highly of her of whom the Lord has blessed above all women? There was only one Christ, and there is only one Mary. Each was noble and great in pre-existence, and each was foreordained to the ministry he or she performed. We cannot but think that the Father would choose the greatest female spirit to be the mother of his Son, even as he chose the male spirit likened to him to be the Savior. End of quote. Chapter 11, verse 14, the phrase, an angel came down. 
It appears that there was now a change in Nephi's guide. An angel whose specific identity is not given now takes Nephi throughout the rest of his visionary journey. 11 verse 16, the phrase, Knowest thou the condescension of God? In other words, Nephi, do you fathom the mystery of it all? Can you can your mortal mind comprehend the infinite wonder and grandeur of the marvelous love made manifest by the Father and the Son? Perhaps no theme is more evident or critical in the Book of Mormon than the announcement of the condescension of God. To condescend is literally to go down among. The condescension of God is to be understood and is taught in this chapter in two ways. The first aspect is the condescension of God the Father, meaning Elohim. The condescension of God lies in the fact that he, an exalted being, steps down from his eternal throne to become the father of a mortal son, a son born after the manner of the flesh. 11 verse 17, the phrase, I know that he loveth his children. One of the fascinating discoveries of those who come to know him, who is eternal, is that God's infinity as almighty does not preclude either his immediacy or his intimacy as a loving father of spirits. Nephi was no doubt familiar with the ministry and writings of Eni. Eni learned firsthand that God was not only a being of passion, but also a tender Lord with compassion. One who sweeps over the waywardness of, weeps over the waywardness of his children, the workmanship of his own hands. Any further observed and bore witness that Elohim's omnipotence and greatness do not establish a personal chasm between him and his children. He who is omniscient and by the power of the light of Christ is omnipresent is equally omniloving. And were it possible, Amy proclaimed in wondrous adoration, that men could number the particles of the earth, yea, millions of the earth like this, it would not be a beginning to the number of thy creations. And thy curtains are stretched out still, and yet thou art there, and thy bosom is there, and also thou art just, thou art merciful and kind forever. The phrase, I do not know the meaning of all things, Prophets, like all of God's children, learn line upon line, precept upon precept. Prophets are not endowed with omniscience from the time of their initial call. They must struggle and search, ponder and pray, investigate and improve from day to day. It is not uncommon for the Lord's spokesman to acknowledge their weaknesses and inadequacies. At the same time, they are eager to acknowledge and proclaim that which they know. This is why we believe that our prophets are not infallible. They too learn line upon line in their calling and will make mistakes. But we have the promise that they will never lead the church completely astray so that it is lost forever. Chapter 11, verse 18, the mother of the Son of God. The first edition of the Book of Mormon in 1830 reads as follows, Behold, the virgin whom thou seest is the mother of God after the manner of flesh. Notice that the Son of God was added later. Indeed, Christ is God, the God of creation, the God of Israel, and the Father of salvation. Mary is his mother. Joseph Smith changed this phrase to the mother of the Son of God in the 1837 and 1840 editions of the Book of Mormon, and all subsequent editions have retained that alteration. Joseph Smith exercised his prophetic editorial right to clarify and explain what had previously been written. This does not mean that when he first translated, he was wrong. He has added things that is his prophetic right as the prophet of this dispensation to add things in the Book of Mormon so that it made it more clear to what the exact intent was. Christ Messiah is God, explained Bruce R. McConkie, quote, such is the plain and pure pronouncement of all the prophets of all the ages. In our desire to avoid the false and absurd conclusions contained in the creeds of Christendom, we are wont to shy away from this pure and unadorned verity. 
we go to great lengths to use language that show that there is both a father and a son, that they are separate persons and are not somehow mystically intertwined as an essence or spirit that is pres everywhere present. Such an approach is perhaps essential in reasoning with the Gentiles of sectarianism. It helps to overthrow the fallacies formulated in their creeds. But having done so, Elder McConkie concludes, if we are to envision our Lord, Lord's true status and glory, we must come back to the pronouncement of pronouncements, the doctrine of doctrines, the message of messages, which is that Christ is God, and if it were not so, he could not save us. End of quote. Verse 11, verse 19, the phrase, she was carried away in the spirit. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, quote, without overstepping the bounds of propriety by saying more than is appropriate, let us say this, God the Almighty, the maker and preserver and upholder of all things, God the Almighty, who is infinite and eternal, elects in his fathomless wisdom to beget a son, an only son, the only begotten in the flesh. God, who is infinite, immortal, condescends to step down from his throne to join with one who is finite and mortal in bringing forth, after the manner of the flesh, the mortal Messiah. End of quote. Chapter 11, verse 21, the phrase, Knowest thou the meaning of the tree? It was as if the angel were summing up, bringing back Nephi to the point where he had begun the deeper significance of the tree. Having seen the virgin bearing the child in her arms, the angel essentially asked, Now do you understand the meaning of the tree? Now do you grasp the message behind the sign? Chapter 11, verse 22, It is the love of God. Nephi answered perfectly from understanding given by the power of the Spirit. Again, the tree represented more than an abstract emotion more than a vague, albeit divine, sentiment. It was the greatest manifestation of the love of God, the gift of Christ. For God so loved the word, Jesus explained to Nicodemus, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The faith sheddeth itself abroad, meaning the love of God was extended to all men through the atonement of Christ, we literally believe that all men may be saved by ordinance to the laws and by and by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. There is no ceiling on the number of saved beings, no limit to the love of the Father which can be received by all those who qualify for exaltation. And again, Moroni said to the Savior, I remember that thou hast said that thou hast loved the world, even unto the laying down of thy life for the world. Continuing, Moroni added, And now I know that this love which thou hast had for the children of men is charity. Chapter 11, verse 23, the phrase, the most joyous to the soul. Nephi described his love of God as the most desirable above all things. The angel added, yea, and the most precious, joyous, and, and the most joyous to the soul. There is no joy in this life which rivals that of partaking of the powers of Christ through the atonement. No joy which transcends those feelings of purity and peace associated with the Master's redemptive and renovating action upon the human soul. Following King, Jem, King Benjamin's mighty sermon, the people cried out for forgiveness of their sins, saying, Oh, have mercy, they pleaded, and apply the atoning blood of Christ, that we may receive forgiveness of our sins, and our hearts may be purified. For we believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who created heaven and earth and all things, who shall come down among the children of men. As a result of their sincere petition, the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, and they were filled with joy, having received a remission of their sins and having peace of conscience. Chapter 11, verse 25, the phrase, the fountain of living waters, or the tree of life. 
It appears that at the end of the straight and narrow path were both the tree of life and a fountain of living waters. The words of Jehovah through his servant Jeremiah are particularly insightful in identifying Christ himself with this joint symbol. My people have committed two evils, the Lord said hastily, for they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold no water. To the woman of Samaria, the Savior taught on this occasion, Whosoever drinketh the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Thus the symbols of the rod of iron, the path, the tree, and the fountain of water all represented Christ, showing that only in and through the Savior can we be saved by his grace that is extended through the atonement. So you can see in Lehi's dream that every symbol of the rod, the path, the tree, the fountain, all of it, the Word of God, all of it represented Jesus Christ. Our focus must be on Christ so that we can give no heed unto those in the great and spacious building. Chapter 11, verse 26, Behold the condescension of God. The second aspect of the condescension of God was that of the Son, meaning Christ, Jehovah, the Father of heaven and of earth, the creator of all things from the beginning, the great I Am, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, would come to earth, leave his divine throne, take a body of flesh and bones, submit himself to the frailties of the flesh and the vile and vicious dispositions of humanity, and work out his own salvation as a mortal man. Such is the doctrine of the condescension of God, the true doctrine of the Incarnation, the message that Jesus is not only the Christ, but also the eternal God. Elder Gerald M. Lund, formerly of the Quorum of Seventy, commented on how well this world describes the coming of the Savior into mortality. Quote, he was Jesus, a member of the Godhead, the firstborn of the Father, the Creator, Jehovah of the Old Testament. Now leaving his divine and holy station, divesting himself of all that glory and majesty, and entering the body of a tiny infant, helpless, completely dependent on his mother and earthly father that he should not come to the finest of earthly palaces and be showered with jewels, but should come to a lowly stable is astonishing. Little wonder that the angel should say to Nephi, Behold the condescension of God. End of quote. Chapter 11, verse 27. The Lamb of God was baptized, and the Holy Ghost came down in the form of a dove. Joseph Smith said, the sign of the dove was instituted before the creation of the world, a witness for the Holy Ghost, and the devil cannot come in the sign of a dove. The Holy Ghost is a personage and is in the form of a personage. It does not confine itself to the form of the dove, but in the sign of the dove. The Holy Ghost cannot be transformed into a dove, but the sign of a dove was given to John to signify the truth of the deed, as a dove is an emblem of or token of truth and innocence. So when John the Baptist sees a dove descending, an actual dove, that was the sign that the Holy Ghost was there and present and descending upon the Savior and upon John. And the sign of the dove, it descending, can only represent the Holy Ghost. That is one thing that Satan cannot duplicate. Satan has a lot of imitations for things. He has an imitation for eternal marriage. It's called marriage for, for this life only. He has a substitute for love. It's called lust. He has all kinds of substitutes to... 
imitate, try to imitate God and to the, discourage mankind and cause them to drift astray. But the one thing the Holy Ghost cannot imitate is, the one thing that the Satan cannot imitate is the Holy Ghost. That is why it is essential that you and I learn how to use the Holy Ghost and get the gift of revelation. Once we learn how to do that with a surety, then Satan cannot have power over us. That is why he is so concerned if you ever figure out how to use the Holy Ghost in your life. The dove was the emblem chosen from the beginning to represent truth, innocence, and the spirit itself. A second facsimile in the book of Abraham confirms this by showing the sign of the Holy Ghost unto Abraham in the form of a dove. The most well-known instance of the sign of the dove is at the baptism of our Lord. By it, John knew for a certainty that he had baptized the Son of God. By the same sign, it was manifest unto Noah that the Lord had made peace with the earth. The dove was given as a sign in connection with the two most important baptisms of history, the Lord's and the earth's. It is the symbol of peace, purity, truth, and the power of the Holy Ghost, all of which can come in their full measure only after the sacred baptismal ordinance. Chapter 11, verse 28, And he went forth in great power and great glory. Coming on this, Alma 550 teaches, Yea, thus saith the Spirit, Repent, all ye ends of the earth, for the kingdom of heaven is soon at hand. Yea, the Son of God cometh in his glory, in his might, majesty, power, and dominion. Yea, my beloved brethren, I say unto you, that the Spirit saith, Behold, the glory of the King of all the earth, and also the King of heaven, shall soon there shall very soon shine forth among all the children of men. Chapter 11, verse 30, the phrase, Angels descending upon the children of men. The ministry of angels is associated with the establishment of the kingdom of God on earth and the gifts of the Spirit enjoyed by faithful members of the Lord's church. The office of their ministry, taught Mormon, is to call men unto repentance and to fulfill and to do the work of the covenants of the Father, which he hath made unto the children of men, by declaring the word of Christ unto the chosen vessels of the Lord, that they may bear testimony of him. Chapter 11, verse 32, Judged of the World What a bitter irony this was! He to whom all judgment had been committed, that is Christ, the keeper of the great, that is Christ, would be judged and condemned by a wicked people devoid of the spirit of wise judgment. The prophet Joseph Smith taught that our Lord, quote, descended in suffering below that which man can suffer, or in other words, suffered greater suffering and was exposed to more powerful contradictions than any man can be, end of quote. What greater contradiction could there be than for the sinless Son of Man, he who came to save the world from judgment, to be judged guilty by man's meager and myopic standards? Chapter 11, verse 34, The Multitudes Fight Against the Apostles Nephi saw in his vision the period of time when the death and resurrection of the Savior, an era during the first century A.D., when persecution and martyrdom became the order of the day for the true believers of Christ, and particularly for those given responsibility to direct the church. Chapter 11, verse 35, the multitude were in a large and spacious building. That is to say, those who fight against Zion and its leaders in the first century as well as in any century thereafter when the church and the kingdom of God are established on the earth are more caught up with the wisdom and wealth of the world than with the treasures of heaven, more enamored with appearance and applause than with divine approbation. Since such are devoid of the Spirit of God themselves, the things of God seem to be but foolishness to them. 
Consequently, they sit satisfied in their secular chapels and mock and taunt and persecute the true believers. The phrase, the house of Israel hath gathered together to fight, meaning it is not alone the Gentiles who have responsibility for putting to death the Lord of life, nor the people from outside the blessed lineage who persecuted the saints of the Most High. Tragically, it is the people of the covenant those who were called in premortality, but who do not merit the chosen status, who murder the mediator of the new covenant and malign the members of his society. The worst persecution of the church are those apostates who were once among or they are still among the members. In like fashion, the latter-day kingdom is, in hinder, is hindered very little from the, by those from outside the fold, persons of me malevolent me mentality who are bent upon the destruction of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. External persecution seems to strengthen the flock and to even interest and provoke the investigator. On the other hand, much damage is done by those who have professed to know the name of the Lord and yet have not known him, persons who blaspheme against God in the midst of his house. There are those who claim membership in the church who feel some need as though by divine decree to set the church straight, to steady the ark, or to change the pace of the forward movement of the caravan of the kingdom. Unless they repent, these shall live and die weak in the faith and shall fall by the wayside with the added demands of discipleship. In the long run, as the Lord explained to Joseph Smith, there is no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And if any man lift his voice against you, he shall be confounded in mine own due time. Wherefore, the master then counsels, keep my commandments. They are true and faithful. Alma 4, 8 through 13 describes how those within the church who have succumbed, su 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 succumbed to pride are those who do the most damage to the church. So here's an example of that, quoting Alma. For they, Alma and righteous members, saw and beheld with great sorrow that the people of the church began to be lifted up in the pride of their eyes and to set their hearts upon the riches and upon the vain things of the world, that they began to be scornful one towards another. They began to prosecute those that did not believe according to their own will and pleasure. And thus, in this eighth year of the reign of the judges, there began to be a great contention among the people of the church. Yea, there were envies and strifes and malice and persecutions and pride, even to exceed the pride of those who did not belong to the church of God. And thus ended the eighth year of the reign of the judges, and the wickedness of the church was a great stumbling block to those who did not belong to the church. And thus the church began to fall in its progress. And it came to pass in the commencement of the ninetieth year, Alma saw the wickedness of the church, and he also saw also that the example of the church began to lead those who were unbelievers on from one piece of iniquity to another, thus bringing on the destruction of the people. Yea, he saw great iniquity among the people, some lifting themselves up with their pride, despising others, turning their backs upon the needy and the naked, and those who were hungry, and those who were athirst, and those who were sick and afflicted. Now this was a great cause for lamentation among the people, while others were abasing themselves, succoring those who stood in need of their succor, such as imparting their substance to the poor and the needy, feeding the hungry, and suffering all manner of affliction for Christ's sake, who should come according to the spirit of prophecy. Chapter 11, verse 36, The great and spacious building fell. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride results in the downfall of all nations and kingdoms, including the kingdom of the devil. Those who choose to ridicule the humble followers of the Nazarene shall eventually be crushed by the power of truth. Those who place their trust in the arm of flesh shall witness to their sorrow and dread that the Almighty is able to bear his arm and demonstrate his omnipotent in behalf of those who rely upon him. 
We now go to 1 Nephi chapter 12. 12 verse 8, the 12 disciples of the Lamb. The 12, the Nephite 12, were generally designated in the Book of Mormon as disciples, were of course apostles in the full and complete sense of the word. They were called, ordained, and set forth to be special witnesses of the name of Christ to the Nephite people. Regarding the manner in which the Nephite 12 were to bestow the Holy Ghost, the Nephite record attests, and he shall call them by name, saying, Ye shall call on the Father in my name in mighty prayer, and after ye have done this, ye shall have power that to him upon whom ye shall lay your hands, ye shall give the Holy Ghost, and in my name ye shall give it, for thus do mine apostles. Joseph Smith wrote to John Wentworth that the Book of Mormon tells us that our Savior made his appearance upon this continent after his resurrection, that he planted the gospel here in all its fullness and richness and power and blessings, that they had apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists, the same order, the same priests, and the same ordinance, gifts, powers, and blessings as were enjoyed on the eastern continent. Chapter 12, verse 9, the twelve ministers of the seed shall be judged. Yea, behold, I write until the ends of the earth, Mormon explained, a millennium after the time of Nephi. Yea, unto you twelve tribes of Israel, who shall be judged according to your works by the twelve whom Jesus chose to be his disciples in the land of Jerusalem. And I write also unto the remnant of this people, who shall also be judged by the twelve whom Jesus chose in this land, and they shall be judged by the other twelve whom Jesus chose in the land of Jerusalem. Chapter 12, verses 10 through 11, the phrase, Because of their faith, their garments are made white. To have one's garments made white in the blood of the Lamb is to be made free from sin and its effects. This through sincere repentance and submission to the will of the Master. It is to be cleansed and sanctified, to be made pure and holy, fit to dwell in the presence of God and angels. Such a state comes through sub subscribing to the ordinances of the gospel and thereafter yielding one's heart unto God. There, there, <clears throat> these are persons whose garments are free from the blood of the world because of the blood of him who overcame the world. They which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. President John Taylor spoke of the necessity of going beyond simply being members of the Lord's Church if we are to be sufficiently worthy to stand before our Father in Heaven. Quote, there is something that goes a little further than we think about sometimes, and that is, while we profess to be followers of the Lord, while we profess to have received the gospel and to be governed by it, a profession will amount to nothing unless we have washed our robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. It is not enough for us to be connected with the Zion of God, for the Zion of God must consist of men that are pure in heart and pure in life and spotless before God. At least that is what we have got to arrive at. We are not there yet. And I would say we are still not there yet. Back to his quote. But we must get there before we shall be prepared to inherit glory and exaltation. Therefore, a form of godliness will amount to but little with any of us. It is not enough for us to embrace the gospel and be associated with the people of God, attend our meetings, and partake of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, and endeavor to move along without much blame of any kind attached to us. For notwithstanding all this, if our hearts are not right, if we are not pure in heart before God, if we have not pure hearts and pure consciences, fearing God and keeping His commandments, we shall not, unless we repent, participate in these blessings about which I have spoken and of which the prophets bear testimony. End of quote. Chapter 12, verses 13 through 23. Nephi's vision of the future continued. He now became an eyewitness of the fact that the Nephite Lamanite battles would continue until the complete destruction of the Nephite nation in about A.D. 421. He saw that the symbols of his father's dream had pathetic but particular relevance to his own 
people because they yielded to the temptations of the devil, the mists of darkness, traversed the broad roads to death rather than the straight and narrow path, and associated themselves with the pride and wisdom of the world, the large and spacious building. They qualified themselves for the depths of hell and thus became separated forever from their God by divine justice. First Nephi chapter 12 through 14 overview. The following chart helps us visualize significant events leading to the establishment of God's kingdom on earth. So here's an interview, and I'm sorry, an overview of the vision that Nephi gives in these chapters. First, sequence of events leading to the establishment of God's kingdom. Nephite nation destroyed. Then Nephi records are preserved. Then the land of promise is discovered by Gentiles. And then the land of promise is settled by Gentiles. Then an international war in the land of promise, the revolutionary war. Then in chapter 14, Gentiles who hearken to the Lord may be numbered among the house of Israel, the restoration of the gospel. Then we see new scriptures comes forth. And then in chapter 14, Christ's church restored. So that's an overview of chapter 12 through chapter 14 of the history of the vision that Nephi sees. Chapter 13 of 1 Nephi, 13, 1 through 9, the great and abominable church. In Revelation to the Church of God, the devil always sets up his kingdom at the very same time in opposition to God. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles defined the great and abominable church. Quote, the titles Church of the Devil and Great and Abominable Church are used to identify all organizations of whatever name or nature, whether political, philosophical, educational, economic, social, fraternal, civic, or religious, which are designed to take men on a course that leads away from God and his laws, and thus from salvation in the kingdom of God. One commentator explained that the Great and Abominable Church consists of more than one entity, Actually, no single known historical church, denomination, or set of believers meets all the requirements for the great and abominable church. It must have formed among the Gentiles. It must have edited and controlled the distribution of the scriptures. It must have slain the saints of God, including the apostles and prophets. It must be in league with civil governments and use their political power to enforce its religious views. It must have dominion over all the earth. It must pursue great wealth and sexual immorality, and it must last until close to the end of the world. No single denomination or system of beliefs fits the entire description. Rather, the role of Babylon has been played by many different agencies, ideologies, and churches at many different times. Boy, this is a great description of our time, isn't it, and of our government and how our government has become prostituted. Continuing his quote, Can we then identify the historical agency that acted as the great and abominable church in early Christianity? Such an agent would have had its origins in the second half of the first century and would have done much of its work in the middle of the second century. This period might be called the blind spot in church history, for it is here that the fewest primary historical sources have been preserved. We have good sources for New Testament Christianity, then the lights go out, so to speak, and we hear the muffled sounds of a great struggle. When the light comes on again a hundred or so years later, we find that someone has rearranged all the furniture, and Christianity has become something very different from what it was in the beginning. End of quote. Chapter 13, verse 5. A church which most is most abominable. We note carefully the language of Nephi and discover that there are degrees of abomination, levels of lasciviousness. Secret combinations began with Cain, but in this vision we are made aware of the formation of a church which was most abominable above all other churches. The phrase which slayeth the saints of God 
The church which Nephi saw in vision was apostate Christianity, that which came out unto being after New Testament times. However, as Bruce R. McConkie points out, quote, this is the kind of inspired utterance that is fulfilled over and over again by the same or an equivalent organization as it happened in the first centuries of Christ's era, Christian era, so we may be assured it has happened and will happen again in our dispensation. The day of persecution and martyrdom has not passed, end of quote. The phrase yoketh them with a yoke of iron, meaning over the decades following the death of the apostles and the loss of the keys of the priesthood, darkness covered the earth and gross darkness filled the minds of the people. Men no longer knew their God or how to return to the divine presence. Cruelty and corrosion and chains were used to bind the bodies of nonconformers. Sin and ignorance bound their hearts and minds of masses of humanity walking in forbidden paths. 13 verse 6, the devil was the founder. Lucifer, a son of the morning, was and is the father of lies and the sire of sin. He seeks to overthrow the kingdom of God and thwart the divine purposes of the father. Chapter, 17, th chapter 13, verse 7, gold and silver and silks. The, the phrase meaning, these are things which are insubstantial, which have no true value in themselves, and which thieves may still easily steal. The things of the soul, matters of righteousness, those things of greatest worth of God, though not readily apparent, may neither be bought nor sold. The phrase, many harlots. Immorality is always associated with apostasy and wealth. Chapter 13, verses 8 through 9, the phrase, praise of the world. Whenever men of any age value the approval of their fellow men more than the approbation of their God, they forfeit the reward that they may have been theirs. Behold, there are many called, but few are chosen. And why are they not chosen? The revealed answer comes, because their hearts are set so much upon the things of this world and aspire to the honors of men, that they do not learn this one lesson, that the rights of the priesthood are inseparably connected with the powers of heaven, and that the powers of heaven cannot be controlled nor handled only upon the principles of righteousness. President Joseph F. Smith warned against three dangers which the saints of God must encounter. First, false educational ideals. Second, sexual impurity. And third, the flattery of prominent men. To those who seek the applause of mortals, the words of the masters are clear and poignant. They have their reward. Boy, do we see the fulfillment of President Joseph F. Smith's prophecy. The false educational ideologies and philosophies that are coming out of our universities today is of such profound wickedness and, dissertation, uh, and distortedness is, is, is amazing. I, I would question in these days sending my children to college because all it is is an indoctrinational place for them to become brainwashed with the philosophies of the world and Satan. And I would almost include probably BYU in that category. Chapter 11, verse 13, chapter 13, verse 11. The wrath of God is upon the seed of thy brethren. Nephi witnessed as the Lamanite nation dwindle in unbelief and thus opened themselves to the punishments and cursings associated with a wicked and wayward life. The soul that sinneth, Jehovah said to the prophet Ezekiel, it shall die. Further, when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the man, wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sins that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. Chapter 13, verse 12, the phrase, A man among the Gentiles, the Spirit of God wrought upon the man. President Ezra Taft Benson identified this man among the Gentiles as Christopher Columbus. Quote, God inspired a man among the Gentiles who, by the Spirit of God, was led to discover the land of America and bring this rich new land to the attention of the people in Europe. 
That man, of course, was Christopher Columbus, who testified that he was inspired in what he did. Our Lord, said Columbus, unlocked my mind, sent me upon the sea, and gave me fire for the deed. Those who heard of my enterprise called it foolish, mocked me, and laughed. But who can doubt but that the Holy Ghost inspired me? End of President Benson's quote, and that of Columbus. There are those who disgrace and deride Columbus, but God used this mortal man who had, who was fallen and had mortal sins, most likely, but used him to follow the Holy Ghost and to discover what he needed to discover so that the church could be restored. President Gord B. Hinckley revered Columbus as being inspired of the Lord. Quote, a host of critics have spoken out against Christopher Columbus. I do not dispute that there were others who came to this Western Hemisphere before him, but it was he who in faith lighted a lamp to look for a new way to China and who in the process discovered America. His was an awesome undertaking to sail west across the unknown seas further than any before him, of his generation. He it was who, in spite of the terror of the unknown and the complaints and near mutiny of his crew, sailed on with fervent prayers to the Almighty for guidance. In his reports to the sovereigns of Spain, Columbus repeatedly asserted that his voyage was for the glory of God and the spread of the Christian faith. Properly do we honor him for his unyielding strength in the face of uncertainty and danger. The destiny of America was divinely decreed, taught Ezra Taft Benson. The events which established our great nation were foreknown to God and revealed to prophets of old. As an enacted drama, the players who come on the scene were rehearsed and selected for their parts. Their talents, abilities, capacities, and weaknesses were known before they were born. As one looks back upon what we call our history, there is a telling theme which reoccurs again and again in this drama. It is that God governs in the affairs of this nation. President Benson also explained, No man, however brilliant and perceptive, shall have a complete perspective of our nation's history without this understanding and conviction. He must be persuaded by God's truth if he is to obtain a true and complete picture of our nation's origin and destiny. Secular scholarship, though useful, provides an incomplete and sometimes inaccurate view of our history. The real story of America is one which shows the hand of God in our nation's beginnings. End of quote. Chapter 13, verse 13, the phrase, the Spirit of God wrought upon other Gentiles. The Spirit of God is also the Spirit of Freedom, Pahoran later taught in the Nephite record. A modern revelation beckoned to the Latter-day Saints, quote, put your trust in that Spirit which leadeth to do good, yea, to, just, to do justly, to walk humbly, to judge righteously, and this is my Spirit, end of quote. Oppression and coercion and ignorance and suppression of the will are all aligned to that spiritual influence which has been given to liberate mankind from sin and selfishness and subservience. One who yields himself to the impressions of heaven will eventually be freed from falsehood as well as the indignities associated with the shackles of servitude. The phrase, other Gentiles went forth out of the captivity. Elder Marky e. Peterson wrote, quote, When it is realized how despotic the European kings were at this period, the time associated with the discovery and settlement of America, it is easily understood that the colonists did flee from captivity and oppression. Under such kings as James I of England, there was hardly a semblance of freedom. He was the supreme dictator in government, in economics, in education, what there was of it, and in the state of religion. He controlled the detailed lives of his people. France, Spain, England, and Portugal were the principal powers involved in the discovery and exploration of America. All were ruled by despots. They were immigrants, and when immigrants finally were allowed to leave their mother countries, they f indeed fled from captivity. The history of the Pilgrims and Puritans gives ample evidence of this fact. End of quote. 
Chapter 13, verse 14, the phrase, My brethren were scattered before the Gentiles. From the time of Columbus's arrival in the New World, the Native Americans began to be scattered and smitten by the colonists. The immigrants were frequently rapacious and unhindered in their plundering of the Lamanites and the natural resources of the land. This treatment of the descendants of Lehi was all part of the prophesied scattering of the Lamanites as a result of their dark and benighted manner of living over many centuries. See, this is why Columbus is sometimes derided. They came here, and how they treated the native peoples of the land was horrendous. Well, that was prophesied clear back in the Nephite time because of the wickedness of the native peoples of the land, which were the Lamanites. These were their descendants. So Columbus is only fulfill, fulfilling the pro prophecy that the descendants of the Lamanites, the people at the time of Columbus, would be scattered and plundered. Chapter 13, verses 15 through 19. The Book of Mormon leaves little doubt as to the position of the prophets with regard to the founding and destiny of America. That God, who opposes slavery and captivity, took sides in the Revolutionary War. That he aided the American colonists in their struggle against Great Britain, the home of the Mother Gentiles, and that the land of America, the site of the sacred or occurrences from Eden to the final Adam on Diamond has a glorious destiny to perform, an integral part in that plan of the Eternal Father for the blessings of mankind. Chapter 13, verses 17 through 19, the phrase, the Lord's hand in the history of the United States of America. President Joseph F. Smith linked the establishment of the United States of America with the restoration of the gospel, quote, this great American nation, the Almighty, raised up by the power of his omnipotent hand, that it might be possible in the latter days for the kingdom of God to be established in the earth. If the Lord had not prepared the way by laying the foundations of this glorious nation, it would not have been impossible under the stringent laws and bigotry and of the monarchical governments of the world to have laid the foundations of the coming of this great kingdom. The Lord has done this. It would have been impossible, I should have read that, if God had not prepared and laid that foundation. Elder Robert D. Hales of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles spoke of how God inspired the founders of America to establish a new nation with religious freedom for all in preparation for the restoration of the gospel. Quote, over a century later, after the discovery of America, such religious feelings guided founders of a new nation on the American continent. Under God's hand, they secured religious freedom for every citizen with an inspired Bill of Rights. Fourteen years later, on December 23, 1805, the prophet Joseph Smith was born. The preparation was nearing its completion for the restoration. End of quote. Chapter 13, verses 20 through 33, I beheld a book. As early as 1820, young Joseph Smith recognized that salvation was not to be found within the covers of the Bible alone. Confusion and uncertainty were the obvious results of unilluminated minds and undirected study, even when the object of that study was the Holy Bible. Seeking for both personal fulfillment and the one system of religious practice which would lead the way back to the divine presence, Joseph Smith discovered that not all the answers were to be found in the Bible. A further lesson was taught to the 17-year-old prophet by the angel Moroni in the year 1823. Moroni quoted numerous passages of scripture to Joseph, particularly Malachi 4, though with a little variation from the way it reads in our Bibles. Whether Moroni gave detailed instructions concerning specific passages of Scripture or whether he taught Joseph how to interpret biblical verses is not known. The prophet did learn, however, that the King James Version of the Bible was not the only authorized translation of the Scriptures. Thus, it was that early in the translation in the Book of Mormon, Joseph Smith received confirmation in his mind that plain and precious truths, including many covenants of the Lord, had been taken away or kept back by an organization whose influence was great and whose actions were abominable. We now learn one of the main reasons for Nephites and 
Nephite's introduction to the great and abominable church early in the chapter to show the impact of the malevolent machinations of this organization upon the scriptural records that would come to be known as the Bible. The Restoration Prophet would therefore make such statements as the following. From sundry revelations which has been received, it was apparent that many important points touching the salvation of men have been taken from the Bible or lost before it was compiled. Also, from what we can draw from the scriptures relative to the teachings of heaven, we are induced to think that much instruction has been given to man since the beginning, which we do not possess now. Finally, and perhaps most instructive in regard to Nephi's vision, I believe the Bible, Joseph Smith quotes, I believe by the Bible as it read when it came from the pen of the original writers. Ignorant translators, careless transcribers, or designing and corrupt priests have committed many errors. End of quote. Through the eyes of Nephi the seer, therefore, we become witnesses of the fact that the world has never had a complete Bible, for it was massively corrupted before it was distributed. By extensively searching and studying the available manuscripts today, honest textual critics may succeed in recovering the Bible to the condition it was in after it was tampered with. In that sense, the worldly biblical scholars, lacking the knowledge provided by the Book of Mormon, have frequently confused the oldest ex ex extant manuscript with the original manuscripts. The information contained on the latter documents has been and will be made known not by manuscripts and scholars, but rather through the modern prophets and revelations as the Lord sees fit to bring back that which has been lost. In other words, there is no original manuscripts left of the Old and New Testament. Those things, the original manuscripts, could only be bought back through prophets. Chapter 13, verse 22, the phrase contains the covenants of the Lord. The Old Testament, in its pristine purity, contained the covenants of the Lord made to his chosen servants from the days of Adam to the ministry of Malachi. No doubt the original documents of those covenants and promises are read much like our present book of Abraham in the Pearl of Great Price, wherein God promised Abraham the blessings of one, a land of promise, two, the gospel, three, the priesthood, and four, eternal life the continuation of the family unit in eternity. In the dispensation of fullness of time, these covenants have been renewed with the descendants of Abraham through the instrumentality of Joseph Smith. All who enter the temples of God and receive the new and everlasting covenant of marriage become heir to all the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Chapter 13, verse 23, the phrase, They are of great worth unto the Gentiles. Specifically, the covenants the Lord was made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, with Moses, with David, and others, as given in the Hebrew Scriptures, are of infinite worth to the Gentile world. In general, who can measure the worth of the Bible to the world, to those of nations other than the nations of Judah? Who can assess the impact this book of books with its timely and timeless truths? As Bruce R. McConkie put it, it has done more with greater numbers of people to preserve Christian culture, uphold gospel ethics, and teach true doctrine than any other book ever written many times over. Nations have been born and have died, continents have been conquered, and hemispheres settled because of biblical influence. There is no way to overstate the worth and blessings of the Bible for mankind. End of quote. Chapter 13, verse 25, these things, the phrase, these things go forth from the Jews in purity unto the Gentiles. The gospel message, the knowledge that Christ atoned for the sins of the world, that he dies, was buried, rose again the third day, and ascended into heaven. This proclamation went forth unto the known world of the first century A.D. through the power of human testimony. Faith came by hearing, and hearing through the word of God, an oral word preached by legal administrators of the Lord Jesus Christ. Most scripture has been, is now, and will continue to be both oral and unrecorded because of the limitations of the human memory. However, as well as the desire to preserve the sacred words of the Lord and his authorized servants, written scriptural records have been kept from the beginning of time. When the Gospels and the Epistles 
first went forth among the Gentiles during the years following the ascension of the Savior, they went forth in purity, untouched, untampered with, undimmed by heresy or misrepresentation. The phrase, according to the truth which is in God, meaning, that is to say, before the work of corruption by the great and abominable church, the scripture record represents the mind of God, the mind of God, divine will in regard to doctrine and practice, and pro proclaimed in writing what he might proclaim verbally if he were present. To Sidney Rigdon, the Lord explained concerning the significance of Sidney's work with the prophet Joseph Smith in the inspired translation of the Bible. And the commandment I give unto thee, that thou shalt write for him, and the scriptures shall be given, even as they are in mine own bosom, to the salvation of mine own elect. Joseph Smith went through the Old and New Testament and put back many of the main and precious truths that had been lacking. It's a shame that he did not completely finish it and publish it the way he wanted before he died. Chapter 13, verse 26, the formation of that great and abominable church. Nephi saw the gradual formation of apostate Christianity, a brand of religion in which was found some of the marks of truth, but which trade wisdom for wealth, saving doctrines for Greek philosophy, proper penance for pen, pen, penance and purgatory, prophecy for oratory, spiritual gifts for mysticism. Chapter 13, verse 26 to 29, the phrase plain and precious truths removed from the Bible. And to Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained the meaning of plain and precious. Quote, elements missing from the Bible were both plain and most precious. They were plain in their simplicity and clarity, being easy to understand of men. They were precious in their purity and profound worth, their saving significance and the eternal importance to the children of God. End of quote. One educator suggested the following explanation for changes in the scripture. Apparently, the original manuscripts of the Bible disappeared very early. This seems particularly true of the New Testament. Sir Frederick Kenyon, one of the greatest textual scholars of the early 20th century, commented thus, The origins of the several books have long ago disappeared. They must have perished in the very infancy of the church, for no allusion is ever made to them by any Christian writer. Keaton's statement is particularly important to us because it means that for centuries there has not been an original Bible manuscript to guide the reader. Even in the early decades of the original Christian church, the original text seemed to have been absent. The angel in 1 Nephi 13, 21-29 makes it clear that he is not talking about subtle accidental of hand and eye resulting in a few misplaced letters or words. The unplanned errors of copyist. He pointedly describes these changes to the planned editorial work of designing men. So there are wicked men who purposely changed the scriptures to their liking. As we read the words of the angel, we discover that the world never has had a complete Bible, for it was massively, even catechismically, corrupted before it was distributed. Of course, in addition to the major willful corruption of the Bible in the Christian era, the manuscripts have also continued to suffer the gradual and relative mi mild changes due to errors of hand and eye that the scholars talk about. Thus, there have been two processes at work. One, a major sudden and deliberate editorial corruption of the text, and two, a gradual prog promulgation of variance that has occurred as a natural consequence of copying and translation. Elder Bruce R. McConkie has written concerning the problem of translation or transmission as follows. As long as inspired men are the keepers of holy writ, as long as prophets and apostles are present to identify and perfect the scriptures by revelation, as long as scriptural translations, as in the instance of the Book of Mormon, are made by the gift and power of God, all will be well within the written word. But when the gospel sun sets and apostate darkness shrouds the minds of men, the scriptural word is in jeopardy. From Adam to Malachi, the ancient biblical world 
word was in prophetic hands. For the next three or four centuries, uninspired men kept the records, adding and deleting as they chose and for their own purposes. During these dark days, apocryphal and pseudopographic writings intermingling as they do the truths of heaven with the heresies from beneath arose in great numbers, and there were no prophetic voices either condemn or to canonize them. History repeatedly itself in New Testament times. The inspired word flowed from spirit-guided pens. Inspired men kept the records, and true believers rejoiced in truths that were thus were theirs. True, there were apostates and traitors, even while the apostles lived. At, but at least there was divine guidance that identified the true word and kept the faith from following every false and every evil wind of uh, doctrine. But after the passing of those who held the keys, which the mind and will of the Lord can be gained, after the holy apostles mingled their blood with that of the prophets who were before them, after the age of inspiration ceased, all was no longer well with the written word. Wolves scattered the flock and tore the flesh of the saints. False teachers led the church into apostate darkness. The post-apostolic fathers wrote their own views, and there was no way to distinguish divine certainty, the light from above, from the darkness that soon covered the earth. What are some examples, one might ask, of some of these plain and precious matters which have been expunged from the biblical, original biblical records? May we not ask what became of such matters in the Old Testament as the identity of Jesus Christ as Jehovah, the ordinance of salvation, baptism, confirmation, sealings, and eternal marriages, the age of accountability, the premoral existence of man, the nature and functions of the Melchizedek priesthood, the typology of the law of Moses, and the particulars concerning the doctrines as the, of, as the creation, the fall, and the atonement. These and myriads of others, including such issues in the New Testament as the timeless nature of the atonement, retroactive and proactive, the doctrine of celestial marriage and the distinction between the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and the signs of the times incident to the second coming were lost to the world until the times of the restitution began in the spring of 1820. The angel made it clear to Nephi and to us that the corruptions of the Bible were not simply a result of subtle accidents of hand and eye, but rather a premeditated program with evil ends in mind. Those involved in this abominable enterprise were part of the mother of harlots, and thus represented and accomplished the purposes of him who is perdition. Even in Jesus' day, the desecration of the scriptures was underway. Woe unto you, lawyers, the Lord cried out, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge, the fullness of the scriptures. Ye enter not in yourselves into the kingdom, and those who were entering in ye hinder. The devil wages war against the scriptures, wrote Elder McConkie. He hates them, perverts their plain meanings, and destroys them when he can. He entices those who heed his temptings to delete and discard, to change and corrupt, to alter and amend, thus taking away the key which will aid in making men wise unto salvation. You see him trying to do this with the Book of Mormon, where you see those who apparently call themselves the intellectuals of the church, and that has to be one of the most arrogant things. The only intellectual that was among us that ever lived on this earth, brothers and sisters, was Jesus Christ. All of us are fallen. But those who claim to be the intellectuals come with all different kinds of philosophies and theories of the Book of Mormon, how it came forth, and its historical reality. And you can see Satan trying to do the same thing with the Book of Mormon. Chapter 13, verse 29, And exceedingly great many do stumble. When precious truths are removed, we are hindered in knowing the verities of scriptures in two ways. One, we do not have access to materials which are removed. And two, we are often unable to properly discern true intents and meanings of which is left, meaning which frequently are made clear by the missing scripture. In short, the greatest commentary upon scripture is scripture. If we have lost valuable elements of the revealed plan, the key of knowledge is not available to open the otherwise mysterious doors of understanding. 
the phrase Satan hath great power over them, meaning Jesus taught his disciples in times meridian. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Further, those who commit sin, in this case through ignorance of the whole law, and thus submission to partial truths, are the servants of sin and under the power of the devil. Chapter 13, verses 30 through 33. God's mercies were abundant. The Almighty One would not allow the seed of Nephi, even those mixed among the seed of Laman, to be destroyed. The Gentiles, even though they would scatter and abuse the seed of Lehi, would not be allowed to extinguish that precious seed from the earth. God has covenanted with the ancients that the seed of Joseph would not ultimately be destroyed. For many of them would hearken to the scripture record of their fathers, that which would become the Book of Mormon. Further, because of the coming forth of other books, the Gentiles would not remain forever in an awful state of blindness, precipitated by the actions of the great and abominable church on the Bible. Chapter 13, verses 30 through 40, the phrase, Plain and Precious Things Restored. President James E. Faust, the first president, spoke of how the standard works of the church have been the principal means of restoring lost truths. Quote, the Apostle John saw in vision a time when an angel would come to earth as part of the restoration of the gospel. That angel was Moroni, who appeared to the prophet Joseph Smith. He directed Joseph to the place where the golden plates contained ancient writings were deposited. Joseph then translated these plates by the gift and power of God, and the Book of Mormon was published. This is a record of two groups of people who lived two centuries ago on the American continent. Little was known about them before the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. But more importantly, the Book of Mormon is another testament of Christ. It restored precious truths concerning the fall, the atonement, the resurrection, and life after death. Prior to the restoration, the heavens had been closed for centuries. But with prophets and apostles upon the earth once more, the heavens were opened once again with visions and revelations. Many of the revelations that came to the prophet Joseph Smith were written down in a book that came to be known as the Doctrine and Covenants. This contains further instructions about principles and ordinance and is a valuable source concerning the structure of the priesthood. In addition, we have another canon of scripture called the Pearl of Great Price. It contains the Book of Moses, which came by revelation to the prophet Joseph Smith, and the Book of Abraham, which he translated from a purchased Egyptian scroll. From these we learn not only a great more deal about Moses, Abraham, Enoch, and other prophets, but also much more detail about the creation. We learn that the gospel of Jesus Christ was taught to all the prophets from the beginning, even from the time of Adam. End of quote. With continuing revelation in the Lord's Church, the process of bringing the plain and precious doctrines and principles of the gospel to people throughout the world is an ongoing process. The conference reports and other inspired writings from the Lord's Apostles and Prophets are vital for gospel understanding of the plain and precious truths. Chapter 13, verse 35, the phrase, I will manifest myself unto my seed. That is, the Lord would make his mind and will known to the Nephite nation through chosen prophets, would reveal himself in person in 600 years' time, and would, through the rec recording and eventual translation of the Nephite record, restore many of the lost truths. Chapter 13, verse 35, By the Gift and Power of the Lamb the coming forth of the Book of Mormon involved a whole series of miraculous and wondrous events. The ministry of angels, the bestowal and use of sacred translation devices, and the gift of prophecy and revelation. Indeed, everything associated with the acquisition and production of the Book of Mormon, particularly the unbelieving brief time associated with its translation and transcription, was beyond human ability and comprehension. The prophet's statement concerning the process of translation is succinct but impactful. Through the medium of the Urim and Thummim, I translated the record by the gift and power of God. Did you catch that? He said, through the medium of the Urim and Thummim, and nothing else did he say in the history of the church that he used by the gift and power of God to translate the Book of Mormon. 
As Moroni indicated on the title page, the pages of the Book of Mormon were written by way of commandment and also by the spirit of prophecy and revelation, written and sealed up and hidden to the Lord that they might not be destroyed, but come forth by the gift and power of God and to the interpretation thereof. Chapter 13, verse 36, in them shall be written my gospel. The Book of Mormon contains the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. First of all, it contains a record of a people who enjoyed the blessings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Second, within its pages, it contains the most per perfect presentation of the gospel, the message that Christ came into the world to atone for the sins of the world, and of the principles of that gospel, faith, repentance, baptism, the gift of the Holy Ghost, endurance to the end, resurrection, and judgment of any scripture record now available. The Book of Mormon does not contain, nor does it claim to do so, the fullness of gospel doctrine. There is no mention within our published version, for example, of eternal marriage or degrees of glory. Rather, its stated purpose is to bring men and women of Christ to center their attention in the God of Israel and to lay stress upon those patterns of living and works of righteousness which evidence one's Christian commitment. The phrase, my rock and my salvation, meaning, after Peter's declaration of his spirit-prompted testimony that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What rock? Joseph Smith asked. The modern seer then answers simply, Revelation. In one sense, then, the Church of Jesus Christ in any age is built upon the granite foundation of modern and current and continuing revelation. In another but related sense, the rock of which the Lord speaks is his gospel itself, as well as the doctrines associated with it. To the assembled multitude in America, the risen Lord explained, And again I say unto you, You must repent and be baptized in my name, and become as little children, or you can no wise inherit the kingdom of God. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that this is my doctrine, and those who build upon this buildeth upon my rock, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. To an anxious and eager Hiram Smith, the Lord taught, you need not suppose that you are called to preach until you are called. Wait a little longer until you shall have my word, my rock, my church, my gospel, that you may know of a surety, my doctrine. The master then canceled. Seek the kingdom of God, and all things shall be added according to that which is judged. Build upon my rock, which is my gospel. Chapter 13, verse 37, the phrase, They shall have the Holy Ghost. Those whose minds are single, who labor to build up the kingdom of God and establish his righteousness, enjoy that spirit and power which is not of this world. They gain the mind of Christ and come to know the view things not available to those less Zion-centered. The phrase, enduring to the end, to endure to the end is keep the commandments after baptism, to remain loyal and true to one's covenants till his mortal probation is finished. It is to be a Christian at all times and in all things, and in all places that ye may be in, even unto death. And if you keep my commandments and endure to the end, you shall have eternal life, which gift is the greatest gift of God. The phrase lifted up and saved unto everlasting kingdom, meaning to be lifted up at the last day is to qualify for the resurrection of the just, and specifically to come forth in the morning of the first resurrection, clothed with the glory, immortality, and eternal lives. It is to be worthy of the celestial kingdom, worthy of eternal life, which consists of one, the continuation of the family unit in eternity, and two, inherit receiving and possessing the fullness of the glory of the Father. The phrase, whosoever shall publish peace, Isaiah proclaimed, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publish peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publishes salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. It is to Abinadi that we turn for help and inspired commentary upon these words. This Nephite prophet informs us that Isaiah had reference to the blessed state of the prophets and preachers and teachers of all ages who have declared the gospel of peace, the glad tidings, the witness of the condescension and 
and ministry of the great God, and have thereby, thereby borne testimony of the Prince and Founder and Source of Peace. Chapter 13, verse 40. The phrase, these last records, establish the truth of the first. Once again, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Prophets Inspired Translation, the King James Bible, all are a part of the doctrinal restoration which began in the spring of 1820 and which will continue through the millennium, have been given to substantiate the verities which have been made the Bible a book of books for centuries. These other books provide an independent source of truth. They are not only corroborating witnesses with the Bible, but also seminal sources, original documents from the heavens, critical collections and treasure houses of truth which restore many of those plain and precious matters that have been taken away or kept back by the great and abominable church. The phrase, the Lamb of God is the Son of the Eternal Father. All of these records together and each of them separately bear witness that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, and that salvation comes through him and his holy name and in no other way. The 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon reads as follows for this segment of this verse, that the Lamb of God is the eternal Father and the Savior of the world. Chapter 31, verse 41, verse 41 the phrase, they both shall be established in one. Second Nephi 3.12 says, Wherefore, the fruit of thy loins, Nephi, shall write, and the fruit of the loins of Judah, the Jews, shall write, and that which shall be written by the fruit of thy loins, the Nephites, and also that which shall be written by the fruit of the loins of Judah, the Jews, shall grow together unto the confounding of false doctrines and laying down of contentions and establishing peace among the fruit of thy loins and bringing them to the knowledge of their fathers in the latter days, and also to the knowledge of my covenant, saith the Lord. This is a very important verse, because it shows, the brothers and sisters, we cannot study the Book of Mormon, and that only, and neglect the Bible. He said they will both together confound false doctrine. We must become conversant in both scriptures, the Bible and the Book of Mormon. Chapter 14, verse 40, chapter 13, verse 42, the last shall be first and the first last. The gospel of Jesus Christ is to go forth to the world according to a divinely established timetable. Our Lord ministered in the flesh to those of the twelve tribes. He said, I am not sent, he taught, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Some years after the resurrection, by a divine decree and by the hand of Peter and Paul and the apostles, the gospel went to the Gentiles. In the last days, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, the gospel was restored and the church of Jesus Christ established first among a Gentile nation from the Latter-day Saints. It shall eventually go preferentially to the Jews and to all the tribes of Israel. Thus those who were once first in receiving the gospel in the millennium of time, the Jews, shall in the last days be last in receiving the message of salvation. On the other hand, those who were last to receive the missionary trust in the first century, the Gentiles, are honored to be the first recipients of the waters of life in the dispensation of the fullness of times. We now turn to chapter 14. Chapter 14, verse 1, The Stumbling Blocks. The stumbling blocks spoken of by the angel appear to be of two types. One, the ignorance and uncertainty which come as a result of the loss of the plain and precious truths of the Bible. And two, the Book of Mormon and the message of the restoration themselves, which will serve as stumbling blocks to the impotent and hard-hearted of the latter days. In the meridian of time, Paul wrote, We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, and unto the Greek, foolishness. Chapter 14, verse 2, They shall be numbered among the seed of thy father. Most of those designated as Gentiles in the Book of Mormon are indeed numbered, are members of the house of Israel by lineal descent. Many of them, however, have not entered into the covenant, for they have not taken upon them the name of the mediator of that covenant and entered into the gospel covenant through an authorized baptism in his name. For behold, I say unto you, Nephi later testified, that as many of the Gentiles as will repent are the covenant people of the Lord, and as many of the Jews or any one 
from the house of Israel, for that matter, as will not repent, will be cast off. For the Lord cometh none so, none save it be with them that repent and believe in the Son, who is the Holy One of Israel. Through the glad tidings of the restoration, and specifically through the message to Israel contained in the Book of Mormon, descendants of Jacob discover who they are and come to know once again the voice of their shepherd. The phrase, no more brought down a captivity, meaning the land of promise was to be a land wherein the promises made to the fathers, the promise of land inheritance of the gospel of the priesthood of eternal life, were to be realized by the faithful. If the people of the Americas would but worship the God of the land, who is Jesus Christ, they would never again know captivity and servitude and slavery, nor would they be led captive by the devil, who subtly seeks to enshroud uh, the unweary in the sleep of death. Have you noticed that we, since we have not kept the covenant promise of, of the Americas, that people are in captivity they're in captivity to drugs, to addictions. They are in servitude and slavery to addiction and to all kinds of things of pornography and drugs and alcohol. The phrase, the house of Israel shall no more be confounded with the restoration of these plain and precious. Israel need no more be scattered nor confounded. The Book of Mormon in particular is the instrument prepared by God to bring about the gathering of Israel in the last days in two ways. One, it provides a description of Israel's condition, the cause for the scattering, as well the means by which she is to be gathered. And two, it provides the specific prescription for accomplishing the task of gathering, namely through the Book of Mormon itself. In short, the Book of Mormon is a scriptural record obtained to accomplish the Father's work because it is the familiar voice, a voice from the dust, which will call Israel home. So 14 verse 3, the great pit shall be filled. Those who rob the scriptures of much of their glorious light shall be left to walk in darkness themselves. In seeking dominion over the souls of others, they have enslaved themselves to a more devilish master. The phrase, not the destruction of the soul, meaning, with few exceptions, the word soul, as used in scripture, refers to the spirit of man, that premortal self, which is literally a son or daughter of God the Father. There is no destruction of the soul, no final dissolution of the spirit. The spirit of man is composed of that pure and fine substance, intelligence, which can neither be created nor destroyed. The phrase, that hell which hath no end, meaning hell is that portion of the post-mortal spirit world wherein the wicked suffer and repent and reconsider. It is also in as utter darkness, a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. This because of the wickedness of those who have suffered themselves to be led captive by Lucifer. The lake of fire and brimstone, whose flames ascend up for an ever and ever, is descriptive of the torment of conscience in this place. Both paradise and hell have an end in the resurrection. Hell is the gateway to the telestial kingdom. It is endless in the sense that those who experience are subject to the punishment of God, whose name is endless. An endless hell, meaning literally a never-ending torment, is reserved exclusively for the sons of perdition, those who inherit outer darkness in and after the resurrection. Chapter 14, verse 7 a great and a marvelous work. And speaking of the time when he would bring the long night of apostasy to a close, the Lord said, Therefore I will proceed to do a marvelous work among the people, yea, a marvelous work and wonder, for the wisdom of the wise and learned shall perish, and the understanding of the prudent shall be hid. The marvelous work was and is the work of restoration of the fullness of the gospel, the beginning of times of restitution, an age initially called by the call of Joseph Smith. The phrase, or work which shall be everlasting, meaning the new and everlasting covenant, is the fullness of the gospel, the aggregate of all covenants and obligations which lead to salvation. This, the gospel is the everlasting 
covenant because it is ordained by him who is everlasting and also because it is everlastingly the same. In all past ages, salvation was gained by adherence to its terms and conditions. And that same compliance will bring the same reward in all future ages. The gospel, when it's taught, is the same in Adam's time, in our time, and in the future. Each time this everlasting covenant is revealed, it is new to those of that dispensation. Hence, the gospel is the new and everlasting covenant. The angel instructed Nephi that once one accepts or rejects the message of the restoration at the peril of his own salvation. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that the significance of the church is twofold. Quote, this church, the great institutional body of Christ, is a marvelous work and a wonder, not only because of what it does for the faithful, but also because of what the faithful do for it. Your lives are at the very heart of that marvel, your evidence of the wonder of it all. End of quote. Chapter 14, verse 10, the phrase there are save two churches only. The doctrine of one true church is as offensive of much, is as offensive to much of Christian Christian world today as was the testimony of Christ anciently that he was the way, the truth, and the life. Yet some reason, as did the youthful Joseph Smith, if God had a church, it would not be split up into factions, and that if he taught one society to worship one way and administered in one set of ordinances, he would not teach another prince another principles which were diamer diametrically opposed. There is no more self-evident truth in this world that there is nothing in all eternity more obvious than if there is and can only be one true church. A true church does not create itself any more than man creates God or resurrects himself or establishes for himself a celestial heaven. All churches may be false, but only one can be true simply because true religion comes from God, and God is not the author of confusion. Jesus Christ is the same which is given of the Father. There is none other name given whereby man can be saved. Wherefore, all men must take upon them the name which is given of the Father. For in that name shall they be called at the last day. Wherefore, if they know not the name by which they are called, they cannot have place in the kingdom of my Father. Thus with Alma they ask, If ye are not the sheep of the good shepherd, of what fold are ye? He answered, Behold, I say unto you, that the devil is your shepherd, and ye are of his fold. Christ made no pretense to being ecumenical. He and his seek alliance with none but God of heaven and his truths. The testimony of all holy writ is that there is but one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Salvation consists of our being one with Christ as he is one with the Father. Further, every true believer, every person who worships the Father in spirit and truth knows because of this one God concept that if he himself is to be saved, he must be one with his fellow saints and with the gods of heaven as they are one with each other. In stating that there are saved only two churches only, the church of the Lamb and the church of the devil, the Lord is not categorically condemning all who are not members of the church, nor is he, for that matter, ensuring an exaltation to all those who have received the fullness of the gospel. The Lord has said that he is pleased with the church collectively and not necessarily individually. We are neither baptized nor judged as congregations. Similarly, when the Lord speaks of the destruction of the church of the devil, it was not intended to be understood as a collective condemnation. Of those who have not yet embraced the true church, Joseph Smith wrote, For there are many yet on the earth among all sects, parties, and denominations who are blinded by the subtle craftiness of men whereby they lie in wait to deceive and who are only kept from the truth because they know not where to find it. Presently, we sustain earthly governments, some of which are particularly better than others, but all of which, which fall short of that divine standard yet to be realized in a millennial day. In doing so, we in no way evidence this 
We in no way evidence disloyalty to the King of Kings. We are simply doing the best we can with what has been provided for the time being. It would be anticipated that with the dawning of a brighter day, our adherence to man-made laws would be relinquished in favor of that which is more perfect. As with governments, also with churches, it is anticipated the honest in hearts will, when shown a more perfect way, eagerly embrace it. Many others, however, may not. The churches of the devil are those who will align themselves with the emerging world government that seeks to overthrow freedom. Notice the emerging world government. The church of the Lamb are those who do not unite with it, but seek the government of God. Elder Bruce R. McCaukey has written, There is only light and darkness. There is not dusky twilight zone in regards to the fullness of salvation. Either men walk in the light or they cannot be saved. Anything less than salvation is not salvation. It may be better to walk in the twilight or to glimpse the first few rays of a distant dawn than to be enveloped in total darkness. But salvation itself is only for those who step forth into the blazing light of the noonday sun. In a day yet further to our own, the polarization between the forces of good and evil will be more acute. Nephi saw in vision that the condescension of God was twofold. The condescension of God the Father and the condescension of, the, of God the Son. He likewise witnessed the great and abominable church in two separate time periods, the period following the New Testament era when the mother of harlots would essentially be apostate Christianity and its rise in the last days to global status. After the restoration of the gospel in its fullness, Lucifer's forces, social, economic, economic, political, fraternal, and religious will become rampant in defiance of the church of the Lamb of God. Chapter 13, verse 11, The whore set upon many waters. The influence of the church of the devil is to be extensive. Her satellites ubiquitous. She and all she stands for will be in all lands and among all peoples. Satan is no respecter of persons or nations. This will be a great day of his power. Chapter 12, 14, verse 12, the church of the Lamb, its numbers were few. When compared with the dominions of the mother of harlots, surely the population of the church of the Lamb in the future day will seem small. And yet one need only reflect for a moment at the present rate of growth, church growth, to consider that by the time in earth's history the saints may well be numbered in the tens and hundreds of millions. Such a vast number, though seemingly great from our current perspective, will yet be few in comparison with the billions of evil disciples. The phrase, the saints were upon all the face of the earth. Bela Busami Konki states, quote, This pertains to a day yet future. The saints of the Most High are not yet as a people and with organized congregations established upon all the face of the earth. When the day comes that they are, they will not compare in power with the forces of evil, end of quote. The Savior prophesied, that the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come, or the destruction of the wicked. The spread of truth will be such that Mormon missionaries and members will be found in all lands before the great and dreadful day of the second advent. Holy temples will extend the blessings of the ancient fathers to all peoples, such that ten thousands times ten thousands and thousands of thousands will cry out in adoration to the Lamb. Thou art worthy to, to, to the book and to open the seal thereof, the record of the seven thousand years of the earth's temple history. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, or queens and priestesses, and we shall reign on the earth. Chapter 14, verse 13, Multitudes to fight the Lamb of God. Our persecutions and difficulties have scarcely begun, wrote Elder McConkie. We saw mobbies and murders and martyrdom as the foundations of the work were laid in the United States. These same things with greater intensity shall yet fall upon the faithful in all nations. Brothers and sisters, we will yet see persecutions in this church that probably have not been seen for centuries. 
Chapter 14, verse 14, the power of the Lamb descended upon the saints. As the wicked of the world sink lower and lower into the depths of depravity and despair, and thereby make their destruction sure, the meek among men, the humble followers of Nazarene, will, of the Nazarene, will make their callings and elections to eternal life, will enjoy the companionship of the Lord and his angels, and will yield power of faith and righteousness by which mighty miracles are wrought. Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, along with all the foregoing reasons for our individual repentance, church members have a special rendezvous to keep, brothers and sisters. Nephi saw it. One future day, he said, Jesus' covenant people scattered upon all the face of the earth will be armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. This will happen, but only after more members become more saintly and more consecrated in conflict. May I submit, even though that was said in 1991, that that is still true. We are not there yet. Elder Neil A. Maxwell of the Quorum of the Twelve Old Apostles also explained that righteousness will be the power of the Lord's people. So let us look at ourselves. For the church, the scripture suggests both an accelerated sifting and accelerated spiritual numerical growth with all this preceding the time when the people of God will be armed with righteousness, not weapons, and when the Lord's glory will be poured out upon them. The Lord is determined to have a tried, pure, and proven people. And there is nothing that the Lord thy God shall take in his heart to do, but he will do it. Brother and sister, we will have to be tried and proven that we are pure people. And that will only come through suffering and persecution and trials. Chapter 14, verse 17, the phrase, Then the work of the Father shall commence. The work of the Father, the work of gathering of Israel, the missionary thrust of the Latter-day Saints, shall go forward with accelerated force when the Lord has displaced the devil and cleansed the earth of the violence and wickedness on its surface. All Israel, the ten tribes included, shall then be gathered in great numbers. So what it's saying, that we, the great, gathering where we will see the coming in of the house of Israel, the lost ten tribes, when that will just be a miraculous event will happen after the wicked have been destroyed. And that part of the millennium of Christ's coming has come. Chapter 14, verses 18 through 30, the record of John the Revelator. Verses 18 through 30 in 1 Nephi 14 refer to the book of Revelation, the last book in the New Testament written by the Apostle John. Nephi saw the events of our day but was not allowed to write them because it was John's responsibility. Verse 26 could have reference to the portion of the Book of Mormon that was sealed. Chapter 14, verse 23, the phrase, the things which were written were plain and pure. Having prophetic vision and a seer's insight, Joseph Smith said, The book of Revelation is one of the plainest books God has ever caused to be written. End of quote. Such, however, is seldom the consensus today of those of the household of faith who seek to extract meaning from the book. Not only is John's ap apocalyptic style with numbers, beasts, plagues, demons, angels, and astral phenomena difficult for us to comprehend, but as Nephi's guide explains, the book of Revelation has been subject to the same scriptural conspiracy as the rest of the canon, the corruption of the texts who planned and intended removal of placeless parts has rendered John's work a sealed book at best to the religious world. If indeed the book was easy to the understanding of all men before the removal of certain parts, one can but imagine how vital and significant those things removed must have been. And to our last chapter now, let's go to chapter 15. 15 chapter 15, verses 2 through 11, hard in their hearts. Nephi's great panoramic vision now ended. Typically, such an experience leaves the participants fixedly exhausted. Such was Nephi's experience, see verse 6. Nephi found his brothers arguing over the meaning of the things Lehi had said unto them by the spirit of prophecy. How strange it is that such things should be a matter of dissension. Surely nothing but their own pride precluded them from asking Lehi for a more complete explanation of his words. It was also their right to learn of things Lehi had prophesied by the spirit of revelation as Nephi had just done. This they also refused to do. 
The meanness of their spirits naturally robs them of the confidence that they could approach the Lord and have him respond. It is the exclusive providence of the household of faith, those filled with the spirit of charity, those who let virtue garnish their thoughts unceasingly, to have their confidence wax strong in the presence of God and celestial knowledge distilled upon their souls as the dews from heaven. In the response to Nephi's question, Have ye inquired of the Lord? His brother said, We have not, for the Lord maketh no such thing known unto us. In response, Nephi reminded, reminded them of a promise apparently recorded on the plates of brass. If ye will not harden your hearts and ask me of faith, believing that ye shall receive with diligence and keep my commandments, surely these things shall be made known unto you. This marvelous promise of personal revelation, which is the providence of the children of God in all ages, was predicated upon their having a willing heart and upon their obedience to all the commandments of God. It is falsely supposed by some that certain of the commandments can be lived in isolation of the others and blessings appended to them obtained. While it is true that there are particular blessings that come from living particular commandments, to obtain the fullness of the blessings, we must live those commandments in concert with all that the Lord has asked us to do. One cannot be select, selectively obedient. Also, one must do the commandments, then they gain a witness, as John 17 7, John 7:17 7, points out, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be God or whether I speak of myself. Laman and Lamiel wanted to know, and then they would go do. This is why they never gained a testimony. They wanted the knowledge, and then they would go do. No, we must go do, and then God will give us a witness. That is the program. Elder Dallin H. Oaks of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles discussed how hard hearts limits our spirituality. Nephi attended teachers of brothers that they could know the meaning of their father's prophetic utterances, which were hard to be understood save a man should acquire of the Lord. Nephi told them if they did not harden their hearts and would keep the commandments and acquire the Lord in faith, surely these things shall be made known unto you. If we harden our hearts, reject continual revelation, and limit our learning to what we can obtain by study and reason on the precise language of the present canon of Scripture, our understanding will be limited to what Alma called the lesser portion of the world. If we seek and accept revelation and inspiration to enlarge our understanding of the Scriptures, we will realize the fulfillment of Nephi's inspired promise that those who seek diligently will have the mysteries of God unfolded unto them by the power of the Holy Ghost. End of quote. The prophet Joseph Smith explained that not only could Laman and Lamiel know the things Nephi and his father knew, but that this principle applies to us as well. Quote, could we all come together with one heart and one mind in perfect faith, the veil might as well be rent today as, as next week or any other time. End of quote. Oh, brothers and sisters, we are so far away of coming together in one heart and one mind, but it is something we must do if we are going to establish Zion. God hath not revealed anything to Joseph, but what he will make known to the twelve, and even the least of saints may know all things as fast as he is able to bear them. Chapter 5, verse 12, an olive tree. The olive tree, an emblem of peace and purity, was frequently used by the ancient prophets as an allegorical representation of Israel or the church and kingdom of God. The families of Lehi and Ishmael were a transplanted branch from that tree. Chapter 15, verses 12 through 13, Jews and Gentiles. We frequently read about Jews and Gentiles in the Book of Mormon. Sometimes it's difficult to understand whom the text is speaking to. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, provided help with this challenge. Both Lehi and Nephi divided all men into, into two camps, Jews and Gentiles. The Jews were either the nationals of the kingdom of Judah or their descendants. All others were considered to be Gentiles. Thus, we are the Gentiles of whom this scripture speaks. We are the ones who have received the fullness of the gospel, and we shall take it to the Lamanites, who are Jews, because their fathers came from Jerusalem and from the kingdom of Judah. 
Elder McClunkey also identified one Gentile who would greatly assist in the restoration. Joseph Smith was the Gentile by whose hand the Book of Mormon came forth, and the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are the Gentiles who carry salvation to the Lamanites and to the Jews. See, we are considered Gentiles because we all come from a Gentile nation. And so that's why Joseph Smith and the saints are called Gentiles. Chapter 15, verse 14. Our seed shall know they are of the house of Israel. It is a doctrinal restoration that is promised. The possession of lands is of little importance when compared to the possession of truths of salvation. Lamanites are to have restored to them the knowledge that they are the house of Israel, and as such are rightful heirs to the promise made to the fathers. Of even greater importance, they are to come to a knowledge of Christ and the saving principles of gospel as he himself preached those principles to their fathers in this choice land. Chapter verse 15, verse 15, the true vine, the true fold of God. The expression true vine and true fold as used by Nephi were metaphorically references to Christ and through Christ to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Israel is scattered and lost primarily in a spiritual sense until they have united again with the Church. No true gathering has taken place. Chapter 15 verse 16, they shall be grafted in. Through the waters of baptism, these descendants of ancient Israel become again a covenant people. Having come to the knowledge of the true Messiah, they now look upon themselves, they now take, they now took upon themselves his name. The phrase, the true olive tree, meaning, as with the true vine and the true fold, the true olive tree was a symbolic reference to the restored church. In the last days, there would be many vines, many folds, many trees, yet there would be only one true olive tree. See, there are Jews gathered in Israel today, but they are not of the house of Israel because they have not entered the covenant of baptism yet. So we have not seen the gathering of Israel, the covenant Israel Jews yet in Jerusalem. President Gordon B. Hinckley declared the impact of the restoration in history. Quote, my brothers and sisters, do you realize what we have? Do you recognize our place in the great drama of human history? This is the focal point of all that has gone before. This is the season of restitution. These are the days of restoration. This is the time when men from over when men from over the earth come to the mountain of the Lord's house to seek and learn of his ways and walk in his paths. This is the summation of all the centuries of time since the birth of Christ to this present and wonderful day. Chapter 15, verse 17, the phrase, until after they are scattered by the Gentiles. On both hemispheres, the chosen seed, having broken their covenants, would be scattered by Gentiles before the day of their restoration to those covenants. In the last days, the gospel would go preferentially first to the Gentiles, that is, Joseph Smith and the restored church, and then to the Jews. Chapter 15, verses 18 through 20. As the prophecies of the scattering and gathering of Israel apply to the Lamanites, so they apply to all the tribes of Israel. The Lamanites were but an illustration of how the prophecy applied in the larger sense to all the house of Israel. That is to say, as the descendants of Lehi were scattered and lost in unbelief, until that day when they again accept the gospel, so the Jews and all the tribes of Israel must, after the day of their suffering, be restored again to the true knowledge of Christ and the saving doctrines and ordinances of the gospel. Chapter 15, verses 21 through 22, the tree of life. In response to the inquiry of his brothers as to the meaning of the tree seen by their father in the dream, Nephi told them that it represented the tree of life. The tree of life was first spoken of in the creation account. It was the tree in the midst of Garden of Eden, the fruit of which contained the power of everlasting life. Written to the seven churches in Asia, John the Revelator said, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. 
having partaken of the fruit in his dream, Lehi described it as most sweet above all that I have ever tasted, before tasted. Yea, and I beheld that the fruit thereof was white, to exceed all whiteness that I had ever seen. It would appear, as noted earlier, that the tree was symbolic representation of Christ, its fruits symbolizing the saving principles of the gospel. All must partake of these fruit if they are to obtain eternal life. The fruit, even more specifically, would be partaking of the atonement of Jesus Christ, becoming pure and washed clean in his blood. Chapter 15, verse 24, the word of God and fiery darts. President Ezra Taftesson spoke of the blessings of having the word of God in our possession. It will not only lead us to great blessings, but give us the strength to stand firm in the, place of temp in the face of temptation. Quote, in his dream, Lehi saw an iron rod which led through the mist of darkness. He saw that if people would hold fast to the rod, they could avoid the rivers of filthiness, stay away from the forbidden paths, stop with, from wandering in strange roads that led to destruction. Later, his son Nephi clearly explained the symbolism of the iron rod. When Laman Lamuel asked, What meaneth the rod of iron? Nephi answered, It was the word of God. And note this promise. Whosoever would hearken unto the word of God, and who will hold fast unto it, they would never perish. Neither could the temptations and the fiery darts of the adversary overpower them unto blindness to lead them away to destruction. Not only will the word of God lead us to the fruit which is desirable above all others, but in the word of God and through it we can find the power to resist temptation the power to thwart the work of Satan and his emissaries. This is why the Savior is keen and works hard that you do not study your scriptures, brothers and sisters. Chapter 19, verses 6 through 29, the river of water. The river of water seen by Lehi in his dream represented the filthiness of the world, which would separate the wicked from Christ and salvation. Indeed, it represented the awful hell which had been prepared for the wicked. The wicked souls in hell are separated from those in paradise by the works of filthiness and the justice of God. Chapter 15, verses 30 through 36, the justice of God. Quote, I mean, meaning, both the justice of God and the laws of nature mandate a division of the wicked from the righteous. The warm and glory of the noonday sun and the midnight shield of darkness are not compatible companions. Light and darkness will never meet. Christ and Satan will never shake hands. The separation of the righteous from the wicked in the world to come is foreshadowed by their separation and mortality. This life, like the one to follow, has its children of light and its children of darkness. The citizens of both kingdoms prepare themselves here for the nature of the society of which they will be a both part here, both part in and after death. Elder Dallin H. Holt spoke of how our works define who we are. What we become through our works constitutes the judgments we will receive. Quote, many Bible modern scriptures speak of a final judgment at which all persons will be rewarded according to their deeds or works or desires of their hearts. But other scriptures enlarge upon this by referring to our being judged by the conditions we have achieved. The prophet Nephi described the final judgment in terms of what we have become. If their works, and if their works have been filthiness, they must needs be filthy. And if they be filthy, it must needs be that they cannot dwell in the kingdom of God, Moroni declares. He that is filthy shall be filthy still, and he that is righteous shall be righteous still. The same would be true of selfishness or disobedience or any other personal attribute inconsistent with the requirements of God. Referring to the state of the wicked in the final judgment, Alma explains that if we are condemned by our words, our works, and our thoughts, we shall not be found spotless, and in this awful state we shall not dare look upon our look we shall not dare to look up to our God. From such teachings, we conclude that the final judgment is not just an evaluation of the sum total of good and evil acts, what we have done. It is an acknowledgment of the final effects of our acts and thoughts, what we have become. 
It is not enough for just for anyone just to go through the motions. The commandments, ordinance, covenants of the gospel are not a list of deposits, requirements to be made in some heavenly account. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a plan that shows us how to become what our heavenly Father desires us to become. End of quote. Thank you for watching. I hope that you have received the Spirit and have learned concerning the things we must do and be to become worthy to be in the presence of our Father for eternity. Thank you. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button.